Hello, Star Trek fans, and welcome to the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. My name is Kim. And my name is James. And we're watching Star Trek Deep Space Nine from the beginning, one episode at a time. Welcome back to the podcast. Today we are on Season 5, Episode 5, The Assignment. This episode aired October 28th, 1996. Before we start on this one, anything to say about last week's episode, which was Nor the Battle to the Strong? No, it was perfect. Such a weird title. It's hard to remember what it was even about. I have not changed my opinion on that episode either, in that it's very confusing about what really the message was. Yeah, I'm not sure what we were supposed to learn. That Jake's a budding war journalist? (laughs) Maybe. It was maybe just Jake's introduction to the awfulness of war. I don't know. I'm not sure why he needed that. Maybe he needs to see something outside of his normal world in order to be a real writer. I think your summary of Jake needs to get off the station and and explore the world or the universe outside is probably a good idea. But at the same time, I hate to lose that character because Sirach Lofton is just great on the show. Yeah, I understand. Well, should we talk about the assignment? Absolutely. In the cold open, we're in Quark's bar early in the morning, and Rom comes in for breakfast after his late shift. I can't believe you missed Morn sitting right there in the foreground. I didn't. This is a Morn scene. All the other people are just superfluous. I didn't miss it. (laughs) And Quark, like, sticks his finger into Morn's breakfast and tastes it. It's really gross. Yeah, I do not want Ferengi touching my food. I'll just put that out there. I don't want anybody sticking their finger in the food on my plate. It was gross. Yeah, I couldn't decide whether Morn had actually finished or whether Quark was just ruining a good breakfast. No, I don't think he'd finished. Well, Quark gives Rom his usual order of puree of beetle, but Rom has decided to try something new. He asks for bacon, eggs, and corned beef hash, which is Chief O'Brien's breakfast of choice. Quark (laughs) says this is the problem with working alongside humans. You pick up their disgusting habits. Oh, I thought it was cute. Rom has a little bit of hero worship for O'Brien. Yeah. Quark pokes at him for working on the station's waste extraction system instead of in the bar. He thinks he's not getting the choice assignments. Although Rom is very upbeat about his work, he says he knows one day Chief O'Brien will recognize his efforts and reward him with a position of respect and responsibility. I think this is when you might say, gosh, you're an upbeat lady. <laughs> <laughs> if Andy McDowell was in the bar, yes, that would be the correct time. <laughs> In the O'Brien quarters, we see that Miles has managed to kill all of Keiko's carefully cared for bonsai trees while she's been away for a few days. He blames Julian because he watered them without anyone asking him to. When Molly sees the dead plants, she says, Mommy's going to be mad. (laughs) And Julian says they're just plants, but Miles knows that's not how Keiko is going to see it. I think Molly had the right take on this whole thing. She did. But also, don't come in and just start watering random plants. That's none of your business. You don't know what the rules are. Well, I think this is a very small scene that, again, is hinting at that really strange thing where he doesn't really seem to relate to things. Yeah. If he doesn't understand sort of the importance or the emotional impact of killing mm. her plants, he has that sort of disconnect. And even the social norm of just watering somebody else's plants without trying to figure out what the rules are about the plants. I can't help but think that they're sort of doing this deliberately with Bashir because they're building up to something that happens, I think, in two or three episodes time. Well, I guess we'll see, since I don't know. (laughs) I don't know what's coming in two or three episodes. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) Well, Julian says to take Keiko some chocolates and to say that he's sorry. And then he runs away because he doesn't want to be blamed. Yeah, he totally bails on responsibility. (laughs) Now we go to Keiko and Miles standing in front of a window where we can see the wormhole opening and closing behind them. Keiko is chomping away at the chocolates, and Miles is blaming (laughs) Julian for killing her plants. And Keiko, with a mouthful of chocolate, tells him to forget it. They're just plants. It's not like something happened to Molly or the baby. And Miles is relieved. She seems surprisingly unconcerned. Yeah, so you already know something's fishy. Yeah. He asks how the fire caves were, and she says, fine. And then she says she has some news. And very kind of -of matter-of-factly, she says, I'm not Keiko. Miles thinks they're playing a fun role-playing game, but she says she's holding his wife's body hostage until he does everything she asks. He still thinks it's cute until she says, do what I say or I'll kill your wife. And then he realizes something is wrong and suggests they go see the doctor, but she says she'll give him a demonstration and suddenly she collapses to the floor and seems to die very quickly. Yeah. Just as Miles reaches for his badge to call for help, she stops him and says, don't make that call or I'll stop her heart forever. Yikes. And we cue the theme song. 
So having been on the Enterprise, don't you think Mars's first reaction to this should be, oh, not again? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it happened to him. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I did have that thought. And also, what's more classic Trek than this when an alien takes over somebody's body? It's pretty funny. I was going to talk about this later, but seeing as you're bringing it up, you have noted the last few episodes. There have been a lot of very un-Star Trek episodes. Yep. They've either been very grim or depressing or they haven't had that uplifting. Everything's going to work out in the end. Yep. How could you get more Star Trek-y than this? <laughs> yeah. We're five minutes in and we have an alien possession. Absolutely. We've got on the Star Trek path. Although there is one thing here. I believe in the original director's cut, when Miles went for the communicator and she says, don't call your friends, he actually said, I was going to call Neela, see if she was out of jail yet. Oh, <laughs> call back to season one. Oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> your brain goes to weird places. Thank you. Well, Miles asks to talk to his wife, but now the fake Keiko just gets up and wipes the blood from under her nose. She says, these corporeal bodies are so fragile. Miles asks what she wants from him, but says he won't do anything to jeopardize the station or the people on it. She tells him not to worry. All he has to do is reconfigure some communication and sensor relays, and she won't tell him why. He says, well, that'll take a while because those things are distributed all around the station, but she knows he's just trying to buy time so that he can figure out how to get help from the others, like trying to catch her in some sort of stasis yeah. field. She says it might work, but if you try, Keiko will die, because she only needs a split second to cause a massive brain hemorrhage. No pressure, Miles. No pressure. Yeah. She seems to have access to all of Keiko's memories. Yeah. Yeah, it's, this is a very scary possession. <laughs> and I do like the hint at a bigger thing here, where she specifically says corporeal. Oh, good point. So here you already know that whoever this is, it's not corporeal. Well, now we go to their quarters and Miles asks her why she didn't take control of him instead of Keiko. But before she can answer, Julian stops by with a plant. We never come back to that question. No. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was fascinating. They just drop that in the air and leave it hanging. <laughs> yeah. Maybe because they know that's what the audience is asking. So they're like, oh, we asked. Oh, but they got interrupted. <laughs> this is that. I'm going to make you think and you can come up with a million reasons. Yeah. Maybe it was her biology. Maybe it's because she'd been exposed to something else on another planet and they could take her over. There's a whole slew of possible reasons. Yeah. Also, though, I feel like she could have really easily just said, well, because you weren't there. <laughs> you know, maybe she can't Ooh. jump bodies, but she was able to come from the crystal to one body, but she had no opportunity to jump to Miles. That would have been a simple answer. What kind of boring reason is that? <laughs> oh, man. I'm just saying we could have closed the loop with that as well. Yeah, you just ruined it. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> I see. You want a geeky answer. She asks Julian if he's coming to the party tonight because it's Miles' birthday and she arranged a surprise party for him, but now she's let the cat out of the bag. After Julian leaves, Miles wants to cancel the party, but Keiko went to a lot of trouble to plan it, the real Keiko, and she says she's going off to cook for the party. I mean, the whole thing is strange. Why would this being think they had to continue to cook for the party? But anyway, she sends Miles off to his shift briefing as she doesn't want to raise suspicion. Now we see Rom rushing to his daily briefing where he finds he's on the swing shift today. I had to look up what that was. I didn't know what that meant. He tries to be part of the group by ordering rack to Gino and saying it very strangely. And he says <laughs> they don't drink that on the night shift. He's really trying hard to fit in, but yeah. this group is just sort of dull and they aren't really engaging with his enthusiasm. Yeah, this lot, they do not seem very motivated. No. Or even friendly. No, not friendly at all. I mean, they're not being negative or anything. They're just, they're like talking to a wall. This is probably the F troop of engineering. Maybe, maybe. They're all here because they got, they killed the Admiral's dog and got reassigned to the back end of nowhere. Oh, maybe. Well, then Miles calls on the view screen to say that there's been a change of plans for the day. He needs to recalibrate the Optronic Integrator on level five, and he gives everyone an assignment, including Rom. He very rudely then tells everyone not to bother him because he's going to be very busy today. <laughs> I'm like, what? I don't know. I thought he was being such a jerk. Well, with the way they're reacting, I would worry that Miles would be just very grumpy to work with. Oh, maybe he's always like that. Well, maybe that's why the team is like they are. I think that's poor leadership for Miles if he's that kind of manager. I totally agree. He's either the sort of jokey guy that he was in the ship. Yeah. Or he's this guy. Which wouldn't necessarily seem to really fit unless 
this swing shift really are the F troop. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe he's just annoyed with this whole group, like, oh, you guys. Yeah. Oh, I got to deal with these ones. Yeah, maybe they bother him all the time. Well, then you got to get better people. Now we go to Miles crawling around in the conduits, and he asks the computer to do a full identity scan of Keiko, and the computer says she's a okay. Then he asks how long a stasis field would take to knock Keiko yeah. unconscious. 2.1 seconds. Not good. Anestatine gas would take 1.4 seconds, and a phaser on stun would take 0.9 seconds. And Miles says, God help me. I like this. A lot of this episode is really well written. Here we have the explanation for why can't you stun her? Why can't you gas her? Why can't you put her in a status field? Nice little wrap up all the ends there. Yeah. I had a thought as he was asking these questions of the computer yeah. of like how somebody's Google search could be <laughs> looked at. Oh. And I was thinking, is anybody tracking these questions? He's asking basically how to knock his wife out. Is anybody yeah. paying attention to the Google searches? Odo gets like a little flashing notification. Yeah. On Miles is trying to kill his wife again. And usually he just gets them from Jake. As a writer, he's researching ways to kill people. Oh. That is what, <laughs> that's what people who write stories oh. do. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, I would also worry about yeah. if this entity has all of Keiko's memories, the entity itself having access to protected systems within the station, because maybe Keiko had overheard Marta's access code, or she's a scientist, so she might be very good at figuring stuff out. Mm. And with the entity being able to access those memories, maybe the entity can use that. Yeah, look, he had an obligation to report this. <laughs> <laughs> I understand why he didn't, but... Because, yeah, I would think she could potentially be monitoring all of Mars's communications. Yeah, she definitely could be. Who's this Neela? <laughs> let go of Neela. She's gone off with Pell if she's out of jail. Well, Miles comes home to his birthday party, and we sing for he's a jolly good fellow instead of happy birthday. And he's the crabbiest unhappy birthday boy ever. Yeah, he definitely is. Maybe it's because he's like, who sings this song? Where do we ever hear this stupid song except on TV? Nobody sings that in real life. <laughs> Miles tries to pretend like everything is fine, but he's never been great at faking anything. Jake asks Keiko if she saw any paw wraiths when she was oh. in the fire caves, yeah, which are some sort of supernatural being that supposedly haunts the caves. She kind of laughs that off and says all she saw was some fascinating fungi. And Jake says he'd like to meet one of the paw wraiths. Yeah, and she's like, oh, maybe you will. <laughs> yes, that was another nice touch. Later, Miles breaks a glass in his hand when he sees Keiko talking to and touching Molly. He snaps at everyone and excuses himself, and everyone just looks at each other. Keiko then privately tells him today's work was just a test to make sure that she could trust him. The real work starts tomorrow. Okay, quick question here. Yep. Don't you think Cisco should have had a private chat with Miles after the party and just say, dude, what's up? As both his well, friend and commanding officer. Well, I did have a thought that maybe he has a bit of a short temper since hard time. And, you know, maybe it's actually improving, but they're kind yeah. of used to him snapping every now and then. If a friend of mine reacted like that at a birthday party, I think I would at least want to say, um, do you want to talk about it? Obviously, something is wrong. Yeah, I would think Julian as his friend is the one who should do that. But yeah, Cisco yeah. as the leader could have just been like, hey, everything OK. Right. It also could just be that they're all thinking there's something going on in their relationship and nobody wants to meddle because it's none of their business. Oh, true. Later, Keiko is cleaning up after the party as Miles tries to get more info out of this fake Keiko. But that doesn't work. He says he's going to sleep on the couch, but fake Keiko says no way. When she goes to bed, he asks the computer about Pa Wraiths, so he's heard something, but there are thousands of entries. So eventually he just goes to bed in the most uncomfortable looking bed I've ever seen, and these pillows are ridiculous, those weird little triangular pillows. These are not inviting. They're, they're not good sleeping pillows, now. And the next morning, Miles wants to send Molly off to stay with another family until this is over, but Keiko is like, a little girl needs her mother. She says she'd never do anything to hurt his daughter. Well, unless, of course, he forces her to. This entity is awful. Yeah. And then she gives him his instructions for the day on a data pad. Did you notice here that Miles asks about legends of the power rates, not mythology? Yeah. So that would imply that maybe there's some truth to it? Well, does he have enough info either way at this point? Well, that's what seems strange to me of wouldn't you ask yeah. about the mythology, especially coming from the Federation? Why wouldn't you just say... Paw race. Did he, he? So he didn't just say, computer, tell me about paw race. He said, 
the legends yeah. of pot race. Hmm. Oh, you know, maybe that's what the Bajorans all refer to them as. So if you it's were possible. talking about the Bajorans, they would always say legends. Okay. Yeah, because that is what Ram says later. Yeah. Oh, yeah, maybe that makes sense. So maybe he'd heard it as part of something a Bajoran said, yeah. like Neela, for example. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let it go, Cam. <laughs> Me? I don't care about Neela. <laughs> I only said it because you've said it twice already today. <laughs> Do you think she slept or did she stay awake all night? Well, if she's living in that body, the body needs rest. Yeah. So I assume she slept. Well, the next day, Miles decides he's going to tell Cisco what's happening and he approaches Cisco on the promenade just as Keiko calls out to him from the second level. When he looks up at her, she just falls forward over the railing and hits the ground. Oh. And everyone runs to her. Yeah, evil Keiko throws herself off the balcony. Well, I thought that this was a very effective thing for her to do. Certainly got Miles' attention and stopped him from doing what he was planning on doing. Oh, yeah. Also, I would think very risky, because if she landed wrong, dead. Yeah. Then maybe she could just jump to someone else? I don't know. We don't know how it works. They didn't explain that. They left us hanging. They did leave us hanging. Well, in the infirmary, Odo is asking what Miles saw before she fell. Like, you know, did someone push her or anything? He doesn't tell them anything, and he makes up a lie about being on the promenade for lunch. Julian says that Keiko has some broken bones, but she's going to be okay. I thought it was really strange that we weren't more suspicious about this. I mean, right. how does somebody just fall over a railing? Yeah, that wasn't broken, and we watched the show for a long time, and people don't typically fall over the railings. It's usually a Vedic pushing them. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that was for a good reason, too. I mean... <laughs> Right. He was from a lower Dajara. He was lesser. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. So if Keiko's passed out and in the infirmary, wouldn't this be the perfect time for Miles to maybe just tell Cisco and say, I don't know if she's monitoring comms. I don't know what control she has. She's been possessed. Yeah. Like, couldn't he have then put her into stasis right. when she fell? Because she seemed, well, maybe she wasn't unconscious, but she Ooh. certainly seemed unconscious when she hit yeah. the ground. That's a good point. Maybe the creature had enough control that she wasn't completely out. I guess it's high risk because yeah. Keiko could be unconscious doesn't mean the creature was. Exactly. So yeah. I can okay, see okay. Miles' concern here. Yeah, yeah. Miles goes in to see her and she says she knew he was going to Cisco to tell him the truth because she knows everything his wife knows. She says this body can't take much more damage, so no more tricks. And then she tells him he has 13 hours to complete the work that she assigned. He's very annoyed, but then in comes Julian to say she needs her rest, and he has to pretend like everything is normal. Ugh. It's the way she's manipulating him is so awful. Oh, it's gross. When Miles walks out onto the promenade, he tells Siri to start a 13-hour timer. Worf comes by to ask after Keiko, and Miles seems edgy, though nothing comes from that little scene, so I wasn't sure what the point was. Michael Dawn's contract, he has to appear in at appear least in every once episode. every episode, yeah. Needs a line. Later, we see Miles working, and we're down to eight hours on the timer, and Rom startles him when he pops his head out from one of the <laughs> tunnels. Yeah. He's looking for his next assignment. Miles is shocked that he's already done with the work that had been assigned to him. When Miles asks how he finished so quickly, he says he didn't bother to get caught up in the distracting discussions that the others were having. <laughs> this points back to my comment on the swing shift. These are the guys who they sit around chatting, avoiding working is what they're doing. But anyway. Ram says that Ferengi can be very focused, especially when no one bothers to talk to them. Yeah, and he says, I'm kind of used to being ignored. Oh, I know. He just wants some friends. I feel bad for Rom here because he kind of carries the sins for all of his race. He's actively trying to be better, be something different. Yeah. And the problem is, I guess this is a reference to sort of the prejudices people would have about the Frankie because most of the Frankie are so awful. Right. And so they don't necessarily believe he's sincere. Right, right. Yeah. Well, Miles tells him that he needs his help and he says he needs Rom to keep his mouth shut. <laughs> he says we need to make modifications to several of the station's systems, and he doesn't want Rom to tell anyone. When Rom asks if Cisco and crew know about this, Miles lies that they do know, but they have to pretend like they don't because it's a top secret Starfleet operation. And Rom says his lips are sealed. He won't even confirm his name if he's questioned. I think we've seen Rom blab everything <laughs> he knows pretty quickly under duress. Yes. In Little Green Men and then... Was it necessary evil where he just like spilled his guts right away? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, they've evolved the character a bit since then. I guess so. Plus, he's trying to impress Miles, I think, he at the is, end of the yeah. day. 
And he wants to show Miles that he's really trustworthy and can be part of the team sort right. of thing. Yeah, he's trying to be more like Miles, yes. which is cute. And now we have a montage of Rom and Miles working, and we learn that there are only six hours left on the timer. As Miles is making some modifications in ops, Dax pops in with some questions. Miles is shocked to see her at 3 a.m., but she couldn't sleep and decided to scan the wormhole for radiometric anomalies. What's wrong with working at 3 a.m. in the morning? (laughs) To scan for radiometric anomalies? I mean, that's just what some people do. There's no better time to work, in my opinion. Well, anyway, she's discovered some things in the station are slightly off spec, so she's discovered whatever is going on. She says she's run a level three diagnostic and she's found there is a saboteur on the station. And she says we better wake up the captain. That dang Dak, she's too smart. And the look on Miles' face here was really good. Like, (laughs) oh, God, you stupid smart people are so annoying. (laughs) Couldn't you just be asleep like normal people? Uh, Exactly, because he's thinking he's going to get away with it because everybody's in bed. It's those symbionts. Yep. Well, everyone is up now and in Cisco's office. Or it might be the wardroom. I wasn't sure because there's one scene where Miles steps away from everybody else and the room looks really long. So they might have been in the wardroom. I do think it's funny here that we all get up in the middle of the night for this so-called emergency and we put our uniforms on. I would have expected somebody to turn up in their jammies. Yeah, Cisco could have been in his cool pajamas. Yeah. Miles and Dax describe 934 tiny fluctuations in the primary communications relays and several power distribution junctions. Cisco wants to know why this is happening. Miles tries to play it down, saying it's hard to call it sabotage. There's been no real damage. Everything is just a little off spec. But Cisco wisely says it might be the tip of an iceberg. Yeah, he says it could be the start of something very dangerous. Yeah. Considering that they are just on the edge of coming out of a war with the Klingons. That's true. And you have the Founders and the Dominion on the back door. That's true. (laughs) I would be very worried in that situation. Somebody doing something subtle that you can't quite figure out? Yeah. Next thing you know, the station's exploded. Yeah. Well, as they debate who might be doing this, Miles is in the corner stressing out as his timer keeps on ticking down. And then Miles gets a call from Keiko and Molly. If the room could have heard this call, they'd have been quite suspicious. Keiko is brushing Molly's hair rather aggressively and reminds Miles he has two hours, 22 minutes, and 13 seconds. Using the kids against him. She is so creepy. And also, are we going to talk about how it's three o'clock in the morning? No. (laughs) And they're all up. The kid is up. She's up and fully dressed. And she was supposed to be resting in the infirmary. Remember, she was in the infirmary and supposed to be resting. And now it's only a few hours later, but she didn't even stay the night. Miles understands the threat. And he goes back to his conversation where he says he might know the saboteur. And now we go to poor Rom, who's working away when Odo asks what he's up to. Rom says he can't talk about it. And then Miles gives him a little wink as Odo arrests him. Miles throws him under the bus yep. and lets Odo arrest him, but gives him a wink of, you're doing good, Rom. Yeah, we're on the same side. Yeah. And then in security, we find that Rom isn't talking, <laughs> just like he said. He wouldn't even confirm his name. I loved it when Odo basically says it took 40 minutes to get him to admit his name. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Rom. He still did, though. Well, like you say, you reach a point with Rom where he just spills the beans. That's right. Well, he'll only talk to Miles, so they call Miles, who says he's busy, but Odo tells him to get down there, and Siri says he only has 36 minutes left, and then he tells the computer to scramble the surveillance channels in Rom's cell before heading there. Yes. And in security, Rom wants to talk to Miles alone, so everybody leaves. Rom says Captain Sisko is very angry, so he's getting edgy. <laughs> Yeah. But Ram has figured out that the changes they're making will focus a chronoton beam at the wormhole. And he wants to know why they're trying to kill the wormhole aliens. Miles is shocked. And he says, but that beam would be harmless. But Ram knows the temporal disruption would kill the wormhole aliens. Miles is like, dang, why didn't I think of that? And he wonders why anyone would want to do that. Yeah. And Ram says everyone has enemies, even the prophets. So Miles wonders what the Pa race have to do with the wormhole aliens. And Rom explains everything now to us as we get a bit of exposition. Yeah. Rom explains about Cosmoran, one of the Bajoran legends, that Lita has been talking to him. He says he's a good listener and like points at his ears. He explains how the Pa wraiths were part of the Celestial Temple, but were cast out because they were false prophets and they were exiled to the 
fire caves on Bajor and forbidden to ever return. Yeah, he says they were imprisoned in crystal fire cages. It's impressive that Rom managed to figure out what they were doing, which was building this chronoton beam before yep. Miles. And the effect that the chronoton beam right. would have, because Miles didn't even think of that. I guess because Miles is so focused on the threat to his yes. wife and Molly. Yep. So Miles realizes that the Pa Wraiths wouldn't be welcomed back into the temple unless they killed the wormhole aliens first. Yeah. So he tells Rom he has to leave him in a tough spot. He admits that nobody else does know about this, and he just needs him to play along a little bit longer. Oh, I felt bad for Rom, because he says to Miles, Me too. The others don't know about any of this, do they? He was so dumb in season one and two, and now they're actually turning him into something more believable. Yes. And something that you can get behind, you can like him. When Miles comes clean, he says, I have to stay here and play the idiot. And then says... I'm Quark's brother. I know the role. Yeah. You feel bad for Rom here because... I know. It's terrible. This is almost an echo of him working for Quark, of the sort of shut up and look stupid kind of approach yeah. that Quark's taken with him all his life. Right, right. So in some way, it's kind of sad that he's looking up to Miles and Miles is almost treating him like Quark. Oh, that makes me feel bad. <laughs> Even worse than I was feeling. But what's sort of noble about Rom here is he still takes the assignment and agrees to do it. He does, yeah. Now Miles is walking with great determination and there are only 12 minutes left on the timer. And then something that we rarely see happens. Miles starts running. <laughs> <laughs> it's a short hallway, though. <laughs> yeah, they sprung for the slightly longer set there. So you yeah. can actually do a couple of running scenes. But he gets back to work and it doesn't take long before Odo arrives, though. Odo was suspicious that Rom wasn't working alone, so he did a little digging, only to discover Miles' fingerprints everywhere. Yeah, you've got to bury stuff really deep for Odo not to find it. Especially if something suspicious happens, or multiple suspicious things. Right, obviously nobody's watched the Odo mysteries. And Kira's not on the station, so there's not something to distract him. Oh, right. He asks Miles why he didn't do a better job covering his tracks, and Miles says because he didn't have time. And then he punches him, and the now human Odo is knocked out. I think this is another example of Odo forgetting that maybe he's not as invulnerable as he used to be. Yep, because he just walked in there without any backup. Right. He's got to learn to take an armed guard with him. Right, or just backup. It, just backup, exactly. Miles does apologize to him as he <laughs> helps him to the floor. <laughs> but Sorry I punched not, you, dude. Him out. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry I tased you. Then he calls Keiko and he says he's finished. He tells her he'll meet her at runabout pad C. He says he knows what she's up to and doesn't give a damn. He just wants his wife back. Yeah. So now we show a runabout taking off. And Miles gives Dax some story about testing the runabout's thrusters. As we get just outside the wormhole, Miles runs a remote program called O'Brien 731 instead of Odo 1. Well, I think Odo's got two programs now. <laughs> Miles has 731 of them. Well, the station starts sparking at the top, and Dax and Cisco are like, what is happening? Oh, and evil Keiko says, you have no idea how many centuries I've waited for this. Yes, and she tells him to target the center of the wormhole. Cisco calls and orders Miles to return, but he doesn't even respond. So yeah. You'd think they would shoot or use a tractor beam or something, but they don't. Keiko says to activate the beam. And then you know, of course, what happens is the beam hits the shuttle instead of the wormhole and yep. Keiko gets zapped and goes down. And she does like a Kermit the Frog <laughs> shout with her arms <laughs> in the yes. air. She's like, ah, oh my God. Hey, at least they didn't have a really obvious stunt double do this. That's very true. I didn't see it the first time I watched the episode. I, I must have been looking down or something, but that was really funny. So are we going to bring up the fact that clearly this is another kind of Star Wars reference here because it shoots force lightning from the station. Yeah. And it's totally the Emperor electrocuting someone when it hits Keiko. So That is what it looked like. I do agree. Yeah. Well, Miles goes to Keiko, who's on the floor, and he rolls her over and is relieved to see that she seems to be already back to normal. So I yep. guess the beam killed the par wraith. I really appreciate part of the writing here that covers a base really nicely and really simply. When they're in the shuttle, evil Keiko says the pulse lasts for only a fraction of a second. They won't see it coming. <laughs> yes. And with this, 
It explains why she was unable to kill Keiko, make any reaction before the beam destroyed her. She couldn't see it coming. Yeah, but there is this thing that we've talked about before where time is not linear for the wormhole aliens. So it's not that they would see anything coming because it's all happened. Right. That's a good point. They closed the wormhole that day because they know in your linear time, this was going to happen. Exactly. I think they kind of hand wave over that because it's actually quite impossible to make them part of a dramatic story if that's really true. We know everything that happens for all time. Yeah. That would be kind of a dull story. Yeah. But then they would also have known that Miles was going to fix it. And, you know, it's all confusing. Oh, that's straight into an over analysis, Kim. So you're saying that the prophets allowed all this to happen because they knew that Miles was going to fix it anyway. Right. Wow. Okay. I haven't seen that the prophets can actually control stuff. So I don't know if they could have just stopped it from happening, but they could have given somebody a vision warning them. But I don't, I don't know what kind of power they have. I think this, uh, your idea that that totally works. I think they could do that. We've seen them do it with Cisco. We've seen them do it with uh, a quorum where they brought him back basically from the dead and changed the timeline. Right. So, yeah, this would be nothing to them. Yeah. The, all the stuff with time, we've seen that power and we've right. seen the visions, but I haven't seen them physically do anything else, I guess. I think they manipulate behind the scenes. They're pulling yeah, strings. That's a superpower. Well, back on the station, Cisco, Odo, Julian, and a security detail are waiting for Miles. <laughs> and Odo is dramatically rubbing his jaw. As Julian takes Keiko aside, Cisco tells Miles he has some explaining to do. Were you thinking of I Love Lucy as well? Yeah, it was a little prat folly. <laughs> In the O'Brien quarters, Keiko says it was like having something coiled around inside her head. She could see and hear through it, but couldn't break through, like being stuck in sand. Right. And the way she said she could sometimes feel its feelings about this cold rage. And she says she doesn't think it intended to leave either one of them alive, which makes sense. Yeah, it was pretty nasty. Yep. Well, we go back to Quarks and we finish the episode where we started, as we often do. And Rom comes in looking tired because he was up all night celebrating his promotion to the day shift with his new team. (laughs) This is very cute. Oh, that was great. Yeah. Also, Rom has discovered that Bacon doesn't agree with him. So he orders pancakes with sausage and pineapple, <laughs> which is the breakfast of choice of the day shift. Yeah. Who orders that? Like a, like a piece of pineapple on the side of the plate? I mean, <laughs> you put them in the pancakes so they get caramelized on the griddle when you cook the pancakes. We have a pancake expert here. <laughs> and I haven't eaten pancakes in years. But anyway... Well, Clark remains true to form in all of this because he says, I knew it, O'Brien fired you. Yep. And he's like, no. (laughs) And when Clark says, well, I'm glad for you, brother. I like how Rom knows his brother well enough to say, I know you don't mean it, but thanks anyway. Yeah, that was cute. All right. Well, the end. So do you have over analysis? Yes, I think I have a few over analysis points. Okay. The first one is Rom on the night shift, quote, doing all the work nobody else wants to. Do you think that's possibly because of O'Brien or Starfleet's bias against the Ferengi or just because Rom is really kind of untested? I expect he has no official qualifications. Right. All they really do know is that, yeah, he's good at fixing replicators. He's good with technology. He can save all the crew when they get stuck in a transporter accident, but they don't really know what he's capable of. What do you think? It's entirely possible that it's due to some kind of discrimination. But he does make a point of saying that he's junior grade. Yeah. So that's how your junior grade people are going to start. The interns and the juniors are starting with the crappiest jobs and working their way out of them. At the same time, even if those individuals aren't necessarily improving at a fast rate, you can't keep them doing that forever. Right. You have to rotate them into other jobs. So you think it's more of like an apprenticeship kind of thing with Rom, of you don't have official Starfleet or recognized qualifications. I'll start you on this and see how you go. I guess that's the way I looked at it. Yeah. But the other thing is possibly true. Well, yeah, you would worry about Ferengis because they've been so awful for so long. Nobody in the Alpha Quadrant will trust them. Yeah, absolutely. I will accept those answers. But the Starfleet way would be to not do that, so... I'm going to hope for the best. Well, we've seen with Starfleet that certainly when it comes to the Ferengis, they're not necessarily living up to their own principles. 
Even Cisco had difficulty with that. Yes, I do understand that. However, there are opportunities in Starfleet to accept a race in sort of one at a time, like Worf is a good example. And Nog. And then Nog. I'm sure many other examples like that. So they've had to deal with this before. Yeah. So I would hope they don't just assume that somebody who wants to be a part of it is somebody that they shouldn't give an opportunity to. Right. I did a lot of negatives in that sense. (laughs) I get what you mean. You, you're basically saying they wouldn't typically exclude someone just because of what race they were. Yeah, exactly. I always hope for the best. It's the Federation way. You've got to think of the best of people. That's right. I could be part of Starfleet. Okay, next thing. Yeah. I think because of working for Quark, Rom has a lot of self-esteem issues and didn't push yeah. for better assignments. Definitely. That's definitely true. It's not just Quark, though. It's also his family and his culture. and Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's good to see Rom getting recognized for his actual skills. Yeah, agreed. By somebody that he sees as a hero as well. Yep. Next thing. So once again, the Bajoran religion is proven to be completely true. Mm. We now know the Pa Wraiths are real. At what point, if you're like a Bajoran believer, do you look at all this stuff and go, holy crap, it's real. It's all real. (laughs) This isn't a question of faith. This is reality. But it's also just another type of alien, so... (laughs) Who didn't have any special powers, I guess, other than they could take over a human, which we've seen before. Common occurrence. Exactly. But yeah, I I hear you. That's something I really missed at the end. I would have loved a conversation about that with Cisco and Kira, although Kira's not in this episode, but that would have been a great thing to talk about. Like at the end of the episode, Destiny, where Cisco and Kira are sort of having that conversation. They're like, holy cow, (laughs) this stuff is real. And the same thing could have happened here. Yeah. Right. And I would wonder, certainly from Kira or Cisco's perspective, if you're not looking at this and going, what else in those legends is real? (laughs) Yeah, definitely. Well, that's what I mean at that end of that episode where Cisco was asking, so what are these other stories then? Yes. <laughs> or the yes. other prophecies I right. think he was looking for. Right. Yeah, right. Okay, next thing. Yeah. This I think is fascinating. Why don't the Parites possess more people? Well, I was wondering about that for sure. Yes. I was thinking that since they didn't show it, maybe yeah. they hadn't figured that out yet. But I thought maybe there was something about a crystal had to break or... You know, something specific uh, had to happen for them to to be able to do it. That yeah. they're because they're supposedly imprisoned, so it doesn't just mean they're in the cave; they're actually imprisoned in those Stuck crystals. There somehow. Yeah, yeah. Maybe the Parais choose not to do it because it's dangerous. They might get killed. Yeah, yeah. Didn't go well for this one. <laughs> yeah, and maybe at the end of the day, you know, they're sort of cowardly. Oh, that could be. They would hmm. rather not risk getting hurt and stay in the caves than to yeah. try and free themselves and get back. Because of the risk. Well, each time one's gotten out, they've never come back and they don't know what happened. And the others haven't been freed. (laughs) That's a good question. Especially when they got called the false prophets. They don't sound like they're the good wormhole aliens. (laughs) Right. They're the evil wormhole aliens. Yeah. We didn't really talk about, I mean, did we kill that paw wraith? Or was it just somehow sent out into the ether? I mean, we didn't really explain that. I guess we're supposed to think yeah. that it was killed because that beam would have killed the wormhole aliens. Yeah. And if they're the same. Yeah, I think that was it, that the beam okay. killed the Paw Wraith. I felt like we could have dropped that 30 second scene with Worf and explained a little bit more at the end. <laughs> I would have liked a little more info, please. The right. Worf thing was, that was just a waste of time. Yeah. And I think this ties to your observation earlier that maybe the prophets were allowing this all to happen because they knew Mars would stop yeah. it. And at the same time, one of the power rates would be killed. Yeah. One less one to worry about. Yeah. So from the prophet's perspective, it's outcome is all hunky-dory, <laughs> all good here. Yeah. Net good. Good job, Miles. And I think my final thing. Yeah. I believe they need to introduce performance reviews and regular skill assessments with the engineering crews because (laughs) clearly Rom hadn't moved up or been given new assignments. So I think they need to to up those just in terms of good management practices. And that swing shift, I think you need to have some training with that swing shift. I don't think I've seen a less motivated team. Even lower decks had more motivation than these guys. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. I don't think Miles has had appropriate leadership training. And maybe that comes from him not having gone to Starfleet Academy, but geez, they could send him to some seminars to learn how to be a better leader. We right. see quite frequently that he's not really that great <laughs> at leadership. <laughs> 
It's like he he works really well if he's got a close relationship with one person, but yeah. we haven't seen him be kind of successful in this role. Mm, I feel it's part of the stereotype. Like he can't do better. Yeah. Oh, I'm not going to be part of management. Why not? Don't want to be. Yeah. Whatever. But you kind of need some of this stuff to make these kind of stories yeah. work, I guess. I know. <laughs> but yeah, I wouldn't leave him in management if I saw stuff like this. Yeah. I'd be like, okay, I got to help him get better. Maybe he's not ready to be managing people yet. Yeah. I'm just really disturbed by that swing crew. I thought they were unfriendly, they were very unhelpful. Strange. It's yeah. like, this is the F troop. It was strange. They weren't mean. Like when he said, oh, we don't drink rack to Gino in the night shift. And the guy's like, fascinating. <laughs> you know, it, it. he didn't go like, oh, gosh, shut up. You're such an idiot. You know, he wasn't like that. He was just No, oh, I thought boring. they were being... I thought they were being passively hostile. Yeah, that's okay. That's fair. If you're in management... You got to do something about that. Yeah. yeah. And my final point, final, final point. I don't know if you remember in Lower Decks, Shax, the Bajoran security officer. Yeah. I think it's on the holodeck where it's actually a hollow version of him. Uh, and they're in a battle. And he says, give my regards to the par rates. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't remember that, I guess, because I didn't know what that was. That's funny. Nice touch. It's nice now that I can talk to you about this because <laughs> you've seen what the power rates are. It is really funny how many callbacks to Deep Space Nine the current shows all have. And they're all things I would never have seen before or gotten. Yeah. So it's nice to have the background. And with that, I shall pass over to you for your overanalysis, Kim. Well, I don't have a lot of stuff in my overanalysis section. I did have the thing about, did we kill the power rate? I really like that Rom is trying new things. Yeah. I don't want him to do it because he feels like he has to in order to fit in, but it doesn't really feel that way. It seems like he's just trying the new experiences to see how they feel because, you know, he, right. he might find the thing that he likes. Frequently, I have said, I'll try something new that I haven't eaten before because it might be my favorite thing. I don't know yet. <laughs> It might be my new favorite thing. Exactly. So that might be what he's doing, right? Pancakes yeah. with sausage. That might be my favorite thing. I hope it's more that than it is, well, this is what my new team does. So I have to do the same thing so that I fit in. I hope it's not that. I don't think it is because he tried the bacon and it didn't work and he was moving on to something else. Yeah. So I think it is, he's being influenced by these things, but he wants to try new experiences right. because they are new experiences. Right, right, right. And overanalyzing. I think it's because the character has broken away from Ferengi tradition right. and it's worked. He has become better and happier for it. Therefore, what other Keep things other within things. Ferengi for oh. tradition should I yeah, exactly move away from? I love that. How much better can things get? Yeah. Okay. It's the evolution of the character outside the confinement he's had all his life. Yeah. I like that. Okay. Well, regardless, I really liked Ram in this episode. I thought he was great. Yeah. I was slightly worried as we got to the end that they weren't <laughs> going to do right by him. And that was yeah. really bothering me. So I was very happy to see oh. that they did because they kept talking about him sort of getting the yeah. short end of the stick. And I just thought, oh my gosh, is that <laughs> is that what's going to happen oh, at the end? Gosh, But I was very happy to see at the end, he had some friends, his job was better. Though I did wonder, was this the right lesson for Rom? Like, do whatever crazy thing your boss tells you to do. I mean, what if Eddington had been his boss? Well, the problem with Eddington is the actual security guys who were on his detachment did what Eddington was telling them. They shut down the communications. They stopped anybody That's true. from... But not... They didn't know that he was lying. At the end, Rom did know that Miles was lying, and he still went along with Miles. But he didn't know if Miles was telling the truth in terms of it being a secret Starfleet. No, no, I mean, when he was talking to him in the cell at the end, when he said, no, yeah. nobody does know, I just need you to play along a little bit longer. Yeah, he did know Miles wasn't telling the truth, that the others didn't know. But I'll say he didn't know whether it really was a secret Starfleet mission. True. It could have been that Miles didn't want to tell him that the others had been replaced with changelings. True. Oh. And this was the way that they were going to figure and it I out. And I guess he's not in Starfleet, so he's making a decision yeah. kind of on his own. But he's certainly putting his job at risk doing something like that. But I think he had a lot of trust in Miles. He did. Yeah. It was earned. It was earned trust. It's not like a guy he's yeah, met. Yeah, exactly. Or Eddington, who, like you would say, has a personal cloak, who would just come out of his cloak and give a bad <laughs> yeah. order and then go back into his cloak. But okay. Right. I did feel like 
Miles could have told them all what was going on when she called when they were in that meeting. Yeah. But he didn't yet know the reason. He didn't learn about the chronoton beam until there was only like 15 minutes left or whatever. So by then he didn't have time. But I did think, would he really not tell anyone? A little bit of a stretch there, I thought. I think I have a little bit of defense for that. The fact that Mars didn't figure out what they were building, what was being modified, points to, I think he was absolutely consumed by the fact that it could kill Molly and it could kill Keiko. Yeah, protecting. And he really wasn't thinking straight. If you like, he was overtaken by fear. And look at the things that have happened to him, like hard times and the other things that have happened to him. Maybe that when he's in full fear mode, he really doesn't think. Well, who does? Well, the last note that I had in my over analysis section was, could that chronoton beam have done anything to Keiko? Like, could we have unstuck her in time or caused some other kind of a problem? I mean, he said it would be harmless, but it seemed like maybe that could have caused a problem. Anytime we have chronoton particles, things go south. exactly. That's exactly why I wrote it down. Yeah. Okay, so that's all I had in over analysis. So let's go to women in the future where I have even less because there's not... (laughs) There's not a lot to say about women in the future here because the pa wraith that was inside of Keiko wasn't male or female, so I, I don't have anything to say about that. I thought it was really cool that Dak sort of unearthed the whole thing because she was scanning for anomalies at three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I thought that was actually pretty good. But other than that, there's not a lot of women in the future to talk about here. Okay. Possible controversial theory here. Okay. Keiko was actually fully in control all the time. The pa wraith was just there. But Keiko was fully in control, Uh and this was a deliberate attempt to kill the aliens, destroy the wormhole, so she could get the hell off the station with her family. (laughs) I've got to believe there's easier ways. No, no. That's the only way. Yeah, what we were seeing here was the real Keiko. Uh, Sure. (laughs) All right, let's go to rating. Thumbs up, thumbs down, or neutral. What is your rating? Absolute thumbs up. Love this episode. This is classic Trek. This has so many great elements. I think the acting in it was also really good. Keiko was great. Miles was great as this very worried husband and father. Max Grodenchik, it was great to see him really given a chance to flesh out Rom as a real character and as somebody who's embracing the most Star Trekiness of things of being the best version of yourself you could be. What else can I give it but an absolute thumbs up? (laughs) Yeah, I also give it a thumbs up. I really enjoyed it. It's just sort of a classic Trek trope, I guess. I like that a lot. And I agree with you. That positivity of what sort of happened to Ram as he was just applying himself and he believed he was going to get promoted and he believed he was (laughs) going to be seen and he was. And I think that was really good. Yeah. One of the super cool things about stories like this is I like them so much and they're so simple. It didn't require even the full cast. It was a, a pretty simple story. There yeah, wasn't yeah. a stupid B story going on. Didn't need to be, yeah. Right. They filled the entire gap of the 46 minutes. And you knew the whole time what was going to happen. You knew everybody was <laughs> was going to be fine. Yeah. And as it got to the end, when you knew it was a beam trying to kill the prophets, you knew he was going to shoot it right at the runabout. I mean, you knew all those things were coming, but it didn't matter. It was still really entertaining. It was still really good. And I liked it a lot. And I don't remember the first time I watched it, but I like the fact that they managed to lead you down the path of were they going to do right by Rom at the end? Or was he just going to get steamrolled it over, thrown under the bus? That was the thing I was most worried about. Yeah, the fact that it managed to do that, that's kind of cool. And then at the end, you do have a very rewarding fulfillment of what Rom wants to achieve. This is also such an important part of my own job. And even though I manage a lot of people that do very complicated things and they all have these very complex skills in engineering and they all do things that I don't do, but I'm always very worried about them as humans. That is such an important part of my job, more so than it was when I was younger and I was more involved in those complex details. Now I just care about the people. And so I was very worried about Ron because I'm like, somebody (laughs) better be paying attention to that guy because you're going to lose him, right? So it it kind of makes sense that that's what I was focused on. And the very last thing I have, this is introducing us to the Paw Wraiths. So we see that the Prophets have enemies, Mm. that there is a faction of the Prophets who are 
false prophets yeah. or the bad guys. Yeah. And even though it's largely a standalone, it's building the mythology of Deep Space Nine. Yeah. Okay. I think that's it for season five, episode five. Come back next week for episode six. In the meantime, if you'd like to send us your own over analysis of this or any episode, or if you just want to say something nice, you can always email us at rebingeit at gmail.com, or you can tweet us at rebingeit. We're also on Instagram and YouTube at rebingeit. You can check us out on talkthroughmedia.com, where you can leave feedback for individual episodes, or you can listen to any of the other Star Trek podcasts on our network. Thanks for joining us on the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. That's it for me. And that's it from me. 